the management of severe TBI. And before I start, here are my disclosure slides. None of them are really uh, relevant to this topic. So I think the first thing to think about is, you know, how we might classify TBI, right? So we're going to talk about severe TBI today. So what, what does that mean? You know, what do we mean by severe versus moderate versus mild? And there's no one um, sort of, you know, right or wrong answer. So I'm going to talk, uh, talk about uh, various different options, right? So you can, you can classify by uh, clinical severity. You can classify by um, sort of imaging findings, right? Otherwise known as pathoanatomical type. You can, you can uh, classify by, by the mechanism, by prognosis, lots of different ways to, of, of grading TBI. This is probably the most widely used way of doing it, just looking at, at the clinical sort of exam on presentation. And uh, severe TBI is generally defined as GCS less than eight, eight or less. Um, and um, the way I, I sort of remember the substance fellowship is just to keep it simple, like the GCS eight intubate, and GCS9, you're fine, right? So that's kind of the dividing line between, um, uh, and it's not just about TBI, like any sort of severe brain injury, right? GCS8 or lower versus nine or above. And you all are, are uh, familiar with uh, the GCS classification as kind of a tried and true, very widely used way of, of uh, quickly summarizing someone's exam. So what are the limitations, right? There's plenty of limitations. Uh, anyone who's sort of worked in a trauma center taking care of patients with, with uh, brain trauma um, could tell you the most obvious one is this issue of factors confounding GCS. And, and so alcohol is a common one, right? So any, any emergency room physician um, has lots of experience with someone coming in who's had you know, massive amounts of alcohol super high blood alcohol level, and then they've got sort of like a forehead contusion and they're out of it, right? And if you try to sort of scan all those patients, um, you, you'll you have a lot of normal scans because the patient's just drunk, but you will periodically, if you don't scan people, miss a really bad traumatic brain injury. And so that, that makes it very, very tricky. Um, there's also pre-injury status, right? So someone who was already kind of like had a pre-morbid disability, um, their, their exam is sort of clouded to start with. And then the biggest problem is that you can have all sorts of different pathophysiologies um, that, that have different levels of risk. Um, and sort of, you know, that could all be mixed together in, in someone who looks like a GCS of eight, right? That could be from a subdural leading to brainstem herniation. Um, it could be from like some trace subarachnoid hemorrhage that led to seizures. A lot of different things can be hiding uh, within that person who has a GCS of eight. So lots of limitations. Uh, what about trying to classify by, by imaging criteria? And I think this is a, a very useful a factor to consider. Uh, and there's a wide variety of things that you know, patients could, could, could you know, show on imaging um, after traumatic uh, brain injury, ranging for sort of extra dural stuff to skull fractures, all sorts of different bleeding patterns, and then evidence of diffuse uh, axonal injury um, all of which have different sort of prognoses, right? So you have to keep all these things in mind. Uh, and, and there's good ways of trying to summarize the imaging findings. I like the Marshall CT classification. It's a lot simpler than it looks. If you look here, it, it just kind of makes it seem a little more uh, complicated than it is. But um, basically, you know, you look at someone's CT scan and the first question is, is there a huge subdural or epidural that needs to be emergently evacuated surgically, right? And if yes, then the person kind of goes down this, this, um, this category here. If most of the time there will not be, there won't be a, there might be a small subdural or no subdural. And so now you're going down this, um, this pathway. And, and so the first thing to ask yourself, okay, first of all, if the scan is totally normal, they're category one, right? Um, if the scan is not normal, the first thing you ask yourself is, are the basal or cisterns open? And I'll show you what that, what that looks like. If the, if the cisterns are um, patent, then it's a category it's a category two, right? If the cisterns are not patent, then then you ask, is there also midline shift, right? So if the pat if the pat cisterns are are not patent, but the there's no midline shift, that's a three. But if the cisterns are faced and there's midline shift, that's a that's a very bad uh, scan, and that makes them a Marshall category four. Okay, so let me let me walk you through some of these. This 
normal head CT, right? So that's a, that's a Marshall category one. You're not going to see that often in someone who has a GCS of eight or less, unless there's a confounding factor like alcohol. Uh, here's a Marshall category two. It's not, you know, abnormal. It's not normal. You see this uh, sort of subarachnoid subdural blood here, but the cisterns are open. This little smiley face thing here is open. So that makes it a category two. This is a, is a much more serious scan. You can see the cisterns here are faced. There's no open space here at all. And that's very, very concerning, um, but there's no midline shift. So that's a three. And then here is the worst kind of pattern. Cisterns are faced and there's, there's a significant midline shift and that's a four. And then here's what I was talking about, a, sur a surgically evacuated lesion, huge subdural gets taken out. Everything looks better and then Here's one with a large subdural um, and, and oh, sorry, this is the same pattern. And this is one where there's a big subdural um, that was not evacuated because the patient had deray hemorrhages in the brainstem and, and the prognosis was felt to be sort of poor. So there was no surgical intervention. All right, so let me, um, let me ask you all, and I know it's hard because um, it's all on the chat button here. I wanna see if I can actually see the chat button. Uh, let's see, chat. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to ask which of these patterns is worse? Uh, the, the picture on the left or picture on the right? And I don't know if we can do this through the chat, so I'll just sort of answer my own question. Um, but this is much worse, right? Because you've lost your cisterns is already like um, a much worse, you know, swelling here than there is in this patient who, yes, they've got this contusion, there's bright, bright, you know, bright blood. And that often is very distracting for people, but the cisterns are wide open. There's plenty of room. This patient is probably gonna survive this, this ICA, uh, this TBI. So I think one lesson when dealing with TBI is to, please do not get distracted by the bright stuff. I see this happen all the time where someone comes in with TBI and on rounds, the way everyone is referring to the patient, it's like, oh, this is the patient with subarachnoid blood from a fall. The subarachnoid blood doesn't matter, right? What, what kills people with TBI is, is swelling and cerebral edema. So don't forget the underlying primary pathophysiology, which is TBI and, and um, the, the blood in the various compartments is sort of a secondary issue most of the time. Um, okay, so that's a really important point. Um, there's other ways besides the Marshall classification uh, that they're potentially more accurate, but they're also like a lot more complicated and they're not as widely used. The Marshall classification is, is pretty uh, commonly used. You can see here in all these big NEJM trials of TBI, uh, they, they uh, usually show the Marshall classification. So I think it's a good idea to get used to that and know, um, know sort of what, what it represents. Okay, what about classifying a TBI by mechanism? Uh, it's definitely useful, right? If you know the mechanism, but oftentimes by the time we're seeing patients, um, some of that stuff is lost and, and we don't have a, a good detail. Like we, this is very common in the ICU. Like we have a patient with terrible TBI, no idea what happened. You know, you just hear like, oh, MBA. You don't know if it was like pedestrian versus auto or if the patient was in the car when, when we don't like have good um, details of the scene, at least early on. And so it can be kind of difficult to get details, but obviously, you know, a high speed MBA is a very different thing than someone falling from, from standing because they, they syncopize. Uh, another way of classifying is to look at prognostic um, sort of instruments. So there's this impact uh, classification calculator, which I really recommend. It's very easy to find TBI impact. You can just search like TBI impact calculator. Very easy to use. You just type in a bunch of stuff that's very easily determined. Um, you can do it quickly on rounds and it will give you a, a, um, uh, a sort of percent probability of a good uh, functional recovery at six months. And, and you can use that to kind of titrate your sense of like how bad is the CBI, right? If it's like 80% probably a good outcome, you're like, oh, this person had, had sort of a moderately bad TBI. If it's a 10% predicted out, uh, out, you know, good outcome, then you know that you're dealing with a really bad brain injury. So which one is best? Uh, obviously trick question. You should consider all these things. And, and I think um, 
when you sort of summarize it together, usually things will be consistent, right? So you have a, you have a bad mechanism, you have um, a, a sort of, you know, Marshall two or three or four on your CT, Marshall three or four probably, uh, and a GCS of like five, all of that is consistent with severe TBI. Sometimes there'll be discordance, right? That the scan looks really bad, but the patient looks great or vice versa. Um, and when the patient looks bad and the scan doesn't look so bad, you really wanna be thinking about what am I missing? You know, is the patient seizing? Is there some toxic component? Um, so you wanna consider all the factors together. All right, and then let's shift over to, to what are the mechanisms of brain injury, of permanent brain injury in people who have TBI, right? So there's, it's useful to break it down into primary injury and secondary injury. And oftentimes, you know, you can't do much about the primary injury, right? If someone gets a bad uh, impact, the brain neurons are immediately, you know, injured. It's very hard to fix that, um, uh, at least with the tools we have now, but there's a lot of secondary injury that can happen that is preventable. And this is where I think the art of, uh, good TBI care, neurocritical care comes in, is trying to anticipate and prevent some of these secondary brain injuries. And I want to classify them in these, these are very common categories, right? So patients can get hypotensive, which leads to worse brain injury. They can get hypoxic, they can get hypercarbic. All these things will exacerbate the, the, the brain injury. So hyperacute supportive care is really crucial for these patients, right? And it's good to have like a checklist, right? ABCs, make sure they're not hypoglycemic, um, that, that there's no ongoing seizures, that you're giving them judicious fluids, so they're not getting hypotensive on you, uh, and then treat their pain, because I think untreated pain is, is likely to, to you know, worsen ICP, and, and you don't wanna get into that kind of cycle. So it, this is my sort of mnemonic for, for acute treatment of, of any brain, acute brain injury. Um, should have a low threshold to intubate these patients. Remember, GCA is eight or less. Don't mess around, just intubate them. Um, you, you, what you don't want to do with these patients is put them on a ventilator and walk away and, and then get a blood gas like three hours later. That's a recipe for disaster. You want to quickly check an ABG, titrate the vent, make sure you're not letting the, CO, the PCO2 get out of range. Um, you, know, you want to avoid hypotension uh, at all costs, avoid hypoglycemia. Uh, I would definitely just start Keppra on these patients. There's decent evidence for a week of prophylactic AEDs, and, and I think it's probably harmless. So um, think about seizure prophylaxis. Don't use hypotonic saline. Uh, we don't want to be worsening cerebral edema. And then treat pain. You know, I think Tylenol plus fentanyl is a good combo, short acting. Um, you can always stop it if you need to. Um, I'm not going to get into this it's a little bit in the weeds. Um, uh, this, I think, is, is, is a sort of recent study. You know, we always focus on the PCO2, but I think the, the cautionary tale from the study is that we should also think about pH. Um, and so even if the PCO2 is good, uh, you, you want to make sure that you're not letting the pH get out of whack also. Um, and then uh, I think too much oxygen in critical illness is increasingly being recognized as being bad. So don't, you know, if you see someone's PTO, PO2 at like 400, that might be a signal to try to dial the vent back a little bit and don't let patients become um, hyperoxygenemic. Uh, so let's move on to surgical management of mass lesions here. Because um, this is often a very acute thing. You know, you've stabilized the patient, you've done the ABCs, uh, and, and before you sort of focus now about uh, on, their, on their ICU course, you want to make sure that there's any kind of surgical lesion uh, that needs to be evacuated, you do that promptly. And a good rule of thumb is that if there's a subdural that's um, more than one centimeter in, in, in width or causing more than half a centimeter of midline shift, those should generally be evacuated. Um, epidural hematomas, if they're enlarging or symptomatic, should be evacuated. And um, contusions generally are kind of left alone or not ma managed uh, surgically. So if you see like a big temporal lobe or frontal lobe hemorrhagic contusion, that's not a sort of surgical uh, disease to manage. And then once you've done that, right, you've stabilized the patient, you have addressed their sort of surgical, immediate surgical um, lesions, then you want to think about, okay, what is going to kill my patient, right? Because TBI is a very, uh, has a high mortality, severe TBI. And what really sort of kills them, the most important thing is brain swelling. And that's what you're going to be really focused on through their, you know, the, the following week after their TBI. Um, but also there's, can, there can be systemic injuries, right? Uh, especially if you're in like a, a trauma ICU that takes care of like multi, you know, 
um, multi-injured uh, um, patients. And then there's systemic complications like pneumonia, you know, sepsis, uh, et cetera. So how do we monitor for swelling and, and how do we uh, keep track of it? In, in the US, you know, the standard of care has, has for a long time been, and I think still kind of remains uh, invasive um, ICP monitoring. And, and it's not clear that that is necessarily the best thing or, or is necessary. Uh, and this was addressed in a, in a pretty uh, you know, landmark and controversial randomized trial um, about a decade ago now, where in South America, they randomized severe TBI patients to, to two strategies, right? Strategy one was kind of the US strategy, you put an ICP monitor, you monitor ICP and you treat if the ICP goes above 20. And then group B was randomized to not getting an ICP monitor and patients were treated for cerebral edema based on exam and, and imaging, right? So how did they do? Uh, well, here's, the, here's sort of the, um, the description of the, of the group. You had about 300 patients, 150 in each group. And the pro primary outcome was um, uh, this GOS -E, Glasgow Extended um, uh, Functional sort of assessment score that's very commonly used. And you can see here the rate of favorable outcomes at six months did not um, uh, really differ between the ICP monitoring group and the clinical monitoring group. Um, the ICP group uh, did, you know, end up using a little bit, um, there was something here, what did they have that slightly less uh, hypertonic saline, right? So the ICP group, they, they were able to be a little more judicious because they were actually seeing the number. The clinical group, I think they were erring on the side of over-treating uh, potential swelling. But despite that, uh, you know, the outcomes were really not all that different. So what does this mean? Um, I think it means that you don't need to worry about being uh, so sort of caught up in this one number, you know, ICP of 20. There's a lot of different signs of, of increased intracranial pressure and cerebral edema. Uh, and I think there's a lot of different things you can, you can follow, right? So I like to, you know, we generally put in ICP monitors and I think it's a very useful piece of information, but it's also very helpful to, to serially monitor your pupils and your motor exam. Um, and if someone is really uh, sort of a borderline case, you can, you can ask your nurses to do uh, Q1 hour pupillometry and document it. And you can kind of graph that and follow it over time. I find that to be a very useful trick. And then daily CTs, right? Just check in every day, see how the swelling is evolving. Um, and, you know, with these two things, you can sometimes get away with not even following an ICP number if you, if, if you have to. But in general, in the US, you will have uh, these three data points um, to follow. All right, so what if your patient does start swelling? Um, uh, good question, what was the, the mortality rate? Let's go back, it's right here. Give me a second. So mortality was also not very different between the groups, right? 39% versus 44%, but very good, very good question. All right, so, okay, so what if, what if you're following the patient, you know, with, with all these different uh, diagnostics, ICP, pupils, uh, head CTs, and the patient does develop, um, you know, bad cerebral edema, elevated intracranial pressure. You know, when I was training as a fellow about like, you know, a decade ago now, um, we really were, were starting to push for early craniectomy, right? And the thought was like, look, my patient's starting to swell. Um, I know it's going to get worse. And so why would I wait until they're sort of like on the verge of herniating um, and, and run the risk that we leave it until it's too late? Why not just go early and do a, 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 a decompressive uh, craniectomy? And that strategy was tested in this DECRA trial where they compared people who, you know, they took people with severe TBI who had just 15 minutes of ICP elevation and right off the bat, they said, okay, at that point, we're gonna randomize some patients to usual care, other patients to go and get an early uh, craniectomy, and you can see the group that got a uh, uh, decompressive craniectomy, immediately the ICP numbers got better, right? Because uh, of very dramatic effect on ICP. But to our surprise, um, there, there really was no um, uh, difference in, in the functional outcomes, right? And if anything, there were worse functional outcomes in the group that got, you know, 
lower numbers on this Gauss E scale are worse. So you can see that the blue line sort of trends more towards the left. The like patients generally have like worse, worse uh, Gauss E scores. So, um, uh, so basically, you know, the 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 takeaway from Decker was do not do a, a prophylactic um, uh, craniectomy because I think what it does is it just takes a group of patients who were, were going to be okay. They probably would have gotten by with just some medical therapy, and you subject them to all the complications of a craniectomy, the wound infections, and et cetera and it actually worsens outcomes. So we moved away from doing early craniectomy for TBI. Um, but what about salvage craniectomy? Someone who you've man you're managing for days, you're doing everything you can, hypertonic saline, you know, sedation, et cetera, and they're still developing refractory ICP, surely surgical, you know, sort of craniectomy at that point is your only option, right? And so that was uh, uh, assessed in this rescue ICP trial uh, where, you know, patients have to go through tier one, and tier two treatments, and only if at that point they still had elevated ICP above 25, then they got randomized to basically uh, decompressive, decompressive craniectomy versus essentially barbiturate coma. And um, what they found is that, you know, craniectomy definitely was life-saving. So you saved a lot of lives. Uh, patients who, you know, didn't get them, a lot more of them died. But the patients who were saved, um, were mostly left with pretty severe disability, right? So you can see it's not really moving the needle on this upper range of recovery here, the blue and green lines. There's no difference in groups. So what you've done is you've taken a bunch of patients who would have died and you've converted them into these highly disabled patients here. Um, and and it's, that's sort of the, the ba evidence base right now is that craniectomy as a salvage therapy is you kind of do it because otherwise your patient's going to die. But at that point, it's unlikely the patient is going to have uh, a very good outcome. Uh, we know that uh, hypothermia also is not a good treatment for TBI. This was assessed in the Eurotherm trial uh, where they um, used hypothermia pretty early on. It's like an early stage thing, which we definitely were doing for a while um, and found that actually, even though you got temperatures down pretty well, um, there actually were, were sort of um, a worse outcomes in the hypothermia group than in the control group. So I think using hypothermia early on in TBI is, is not uh, a good idea. There was a, the, a follow-up trial, the polar trial, which found no difference between groups in, in the use of hypothermia. So I think cooling people is really not a good evidence-based um, treatment for, for TBI. Okay, so what can we do? What are, what are sort of our proven treatment? Well, we don't actually have all that many proven like evidence-based treatments. This is just kind of like historically how we've managed it. There's a lot of clinical experience, um, but this is, I think, uh, a good, reasonable, you know, approach. Um, and, and this is how I would sort of define various tiers of treatment. So tier one, you know, head of bed up, Make sure your PCO2 is, is within, you know, range 35 to 40, I would recommend. Make sure you're treating their pain and make sure you're sedating them, right? That's like key, basic bedrock. Very, very important to managing ICP and cerebral edema. Tier two is if you have an EVD in place, drain some, some fluid um, and then use osmotic therapy, mannitol versus hypertonic saline. Hypertonic saline probably is a little bit better and safer but if it's a really bad situation, you often end up alternating hypertonic saline and mannitol. Uh, and then I sort of reach for paralytics uh, at the end of this tier if, if uh, all of this above is not working. And then tier three is kind of craniectomy and, and pentobarbital. And usually you don't have to go to the stage, but once in a while you do. All right, so besides managing swelling, the other thing, the other important task when you're taking care of uh, TBI patients, you have to avoid secondary brain injury and uh, common causes are brain swelling, which we talked about how to monitor and treat that, um, systemic complications, and then hypotension, right? And other iatrogenic things. Um, to help with that, yeah. Um, is there any evidence-based guidance on salvage craniectomy versus no surgical intervention, or is the standard of care to provide craniectomy to all? And is there any age-based guidance? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it is kind of evidence-based, right? Based on rescue ICP that, that 
salvage craniectomy is life-saving. And so that's kind of the standard of care. Um, I, I think that you, you can counsel patients that like the patients are likely, you know, if they need, if they're at that point, that if they're probably going to be left with a very high chance of permanent disability. And so, you know, maybe older patients, the family might say they wouldn't want to live like that, but I think it's, it's kind of the, the standard of care. And there's no like age-based cutoffs that I'm aware of um, for when you would not, you know, not offer it. But it's, it's a little bit of a matter of interpretation too, because, you know, it depends on whether a neurosurgeon thinks that there's already like devastating brain injury, or if the patient has like blown their pupils, or I mean, it gets a little bit, gets a little bit more um, detailed. But in general, I think salvage craniectomy is standard of care uh, as a life-saving measure. Okay, cool. So you're trying to sort of avoid all these iatrogenic injuries and secondary brain injuries. So uh, in that context, you know, we think that monitoring someone's um, brain oxygen tension or partial brain tension of oxygen, PbO2, um, provides some useful information. We've been using it clinically for several decades now. It's basically a small probe that gets implanted through a burr hole by the neurosurgery team. And then it gives you this, this um, uh, number in millimeters of mercury that is sort of a good proxy for cerebral blood flow. And uh, clinically, I think we found it useful. And there's some, some uh, early stage evidence from a randomized trial called BOOST2 that found improved outcomes when patients' care was sort of guided by a, a PBO2 monitor. And then there's a larger BOOST3 trial that's ongoing right now that I think will tell us uh, more definitively if this actually helps improve outcomes. Um, at the same time, though, there's also some, some concerning data about how reliable this is. So, you know, for sure, we know that people with, with TBI develop um, uh, hypoxic, you know, ischemic brain injury. And you can see here, there's a really nice PET study. Um, they took, a, you know, set many dozen patients with acute TBI and put them in a PET scanner. And you can see, especially here in the first 24 hours, your cerebral blood flow is lower than you would expect in, in, in healthy patients. Um, and, and the patient, the brain seems very hungry for oxygen, right? It's like extracting more oxygen than it's getting, suggesting that the, that the brain is ischemic. Um, but compared to PET, the, the PBO2 monitors in this study did not really correlate well with PET, which is like the gold standard. So we still use PBO2, but I think don't make it like the only thing that you're following because there are some cautionary data about it. And I think we'll learn more from the BOOST3 trial. Uh, and I think more and more, I'm thinking about using CT perfusion as an adjunct, right? So if, I'm, if I have a PBO2 monitor, but I'm not sure if I trust what I'm seeing, um, I think it's not unreasonable to get a CT perfusion study as well to try to get a sense of are there at least kind of like local areas of ischemia um, and, and vasospasm, which you can definitely see after TBI. Uh, in the meantime, if you, do if you do see evidence of ischemia, you know, either on the PBO2 or in your, in your perfusion scans, um, sort of the way you should respond, I think, is with these four things. And, and the mnemonic that I uh, use is intensive care, better outcomes, right? So ICBO, think about ICP, make sure you check it, you address it, uh, check your CO2, make sure you're not uh, hyperventilating patients because that will cause vasoconstriction and reduce blood flow to the brain. Um, try to judiciously increase your blood pressure with vasopressors, but be careful because you know these patients often lose the ability to auto-regulate. Uh, and if you, if you go too aggressively, you may actually cause uh, bleeding. Um, and then, you know, what people reflexively sometimes do is just adjust the FiO2 on the ventilator when they see the, the PbO2 number go down. And that is not helpful, right? That just masks the problem because you're using PbO2 not as a, like a pulse ox, right? You don't care about the brain's um, oxygen saturation. Well, you're using PbO2 is as a surrogate for cerebral blood flow. So if your PbO2 is dropping, it's telling you that the brain is not getting enough blood. And, and so just jacking up the, Fi, the FiO2 on your ventilator does not in, increase cerebral blood flow, right? It just masks the problem by making the PbO2 go up, but you haven't actually addressed the underlying cause. So really focus on ICP, PCO2 and, and blood pressure. Um, 
Remember to exclude vessel injury. These patients with TBI can often get traumatic dissections of their cervical vessels, and that can put them at risk for, for strokes. So think about that. Typically, when we see a dissection, we'll just start aspirin. Um, and, and sort of around 48 hours, if there's been several stability scans, I feel comfortable starting a baby aspirin uh, in these patients. Um, and uh, if there's a traumatic sinus thrombosis, a venous sinus thrombosis, Unlike other kinds of sinus thrombosis that you see like spon happening spontaneously in people with autoimmune disease, et cetera, when it's a traumatic sinus thrombosis, you don't have to heparinize these people. They often will get better on their own and they don't propagate. So don't, don't um, just rush to starting heparin um, if you see a traumatic sinus thrombosis. And then be vigilant for vasospasm. I mentioned that, that these patients can develop vasospasm. Uh, it's definitely not as frequent, but as in, you know, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, but it still occurs. We've had some terrible cases uh, here. Uh, and, and especially if there is a lot of cisternal subarachnoid blood, um, play, pay special attention. You can get a TCD or get a CTA. Uh, and certainly if you see a, a new areas of infarction happening on your follow-up CTs, you should definitely get a CTA to look for spasm. And then some last like key points that you know you don't want to forget about is that these patients often will develop SIDH that can worsen their edema. So you really have to watch their sodium. Um, if someone has a basal or skull fracture, they are at high risk for meningitis. And so a patient with severe TBI who has a basal or skull fracture, who gets any kind of unexplained, unexplained neurological deterioration, high fevers, et cetera, you should have a very low threshold to culture and start empiric um, meningitis dose antibiotics. Uh, and then also these patients give up a lot of pituitary dysfunction, which isn't a huge issue in the acute setting, but once they start getting through that acute setting, it can cause a lot of problems. And, and that should be something you should think about and, and potentially screen for. And that is it, that's my talk. I'll stop here, see if folks have any questions in the chat. Let's see. Okay, guys. So don't forget to, the post test is now in the chat. Please don't forget to log on to that and answer a couple of questions. Um, all right, if no one has any questions, thank you so much, Dr. Kamel. That was great. Oh, wait, wait. What are some of the most common missed issues? Uh, in severe TBI, I would say um, uh, basal spasm, 